Well, Thank I will you. start by just introducing Lisa Gottlieb, who I think some of you all know. Lisa is the director of the Center for Compassionate Communication. Um, I sent around a draft of, I think, a new book that she's writing for you all to take a look at to kind of be a, a framework for what we're going to go over this session and uh, next month's session as well. So thank you so much for being here, Lisa. We really appreciate your time um, and your willingness to join us. So with that, I will just turn it over to Lisa. Great, thank you, Gail, and Craig, thanks for doing the technical stuff. And <clears throat> would you go ahead and mute everyone? Uh, Craig, are you, will you be my support person in terms of technical no, stuff? I'll do that. I'll okay, do that. great. If you'll mute everybody, and then I'll ask people to unmute as it's time to speak. Um, hmm. Well, it's really great to be here. It's been a few years since I was uh, part of this lunchtime series with uh, DRC and it's thrilling to be back. I know some of you have had some experience in nonviolent or compassionate communication as it's sometimes called. So uh, for those of you who've had some experience with me before, um, I'm hopeful that you'll be, lead the interactions and lead the shared stuff because that makes it more interesting. I I don't really like to just um, sort of lecture and have people sit and listen. I really like a lot of interactive stuff. Um, and um, let me just see if I could see a show of hands, either physical hands or your mechanical hands through Zoom. If you've had a nonviolent communication training with me or anyone else previously. So if you have a bit of NBC experience, can I see your physical or mechanical hand? That helps me know, great, okay. And um, I did uh, include the draft of a book I'm writing, which I hope you'll excuse the typos and grammar issues, it's a draft. Um, so I'm hoping that that sort of helps get us started too. And all that being said, this first meeting is meant to give us some introduction to nonviolent communication consciousness and practical tools. I'm really big on offering things that are tools that we can all start to use right away to shift how we might be engaging, uh, engaging with other people. Um, so I'm going to ask that everybody stay muted. If you're not muted, go ahead and mute yourself. And then if I call on you, then I might remind you to unmute. Um, so because there's a number of us here, I'm a little torn about doing introductions because introductions can take quite a bit of time. Uh, and instead of it, it for to, to work with that in a way that I think will be our best use of time and keep the energy up, I would love that if you'd take a moment and write in the chat one thing that you're hoping to take out of our time together. So take a moment and um, add it to the chat and if for some reason you don't have access to the chat because you're on your phone instead of on a computer or something like that or you're limited in being able to use your chat then raise your hand and i'll call on you um, so you have some options here either raising your hand to speak about one thing that you're hoping to come away with with this uh program or please write it in the chat and I'm hearing one thing, I'm reading something in the chat, learn something new, big fan of NBC. Uh, ability to immediately respond helpfully in contentious situations. Oh, yeah, that is such a great skill and practice to have. Anybody else? Take a moment. And hello and welcome to people who are just signing on. Learn to forgive myself. Yeah. There is such a big component in holding ourselves accountable with grace and dignity and empathy. Um, yeah, help with impasse. Learn more empathic communication. Yes, use reminders and nudges to actually think of and use NBC in real life, right? That's, it's like, oh, I know all this stuff, and then I'm triggered or I'm flooded or I'm aggravated, and it goes right out the window. Yeah talk nicer, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> oh, how to stay present in the face of anger. Yes. I, look, these are beautiful expressions. And I'm, I'm really grateful for these because it's so much a lot about what we're, what we're doing here. Um, you know, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that's fine now, because I want to give my full attention to the room and less on the chat. Um, thank you, everyone for contributing. Uh, look, these are incredibly divisive times. And there is so much going on in the world at large, globally, and in our own country and locally, that is incredibly painful, provocative, infuriating, all at the same time. And it's so easy to become dysregulated and hopeless uh, and sort of have this sense of how do I live in the world in a way that meets my own values and contributes to things that are important to others? How do we keep everyone safe in a climate that truly is violent and dangerous? Um, and I will say that over the past few years, it, I've been, I find that I, unless I bring up issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, unless I specifically name that misogyny and racism and bigotry are ingrained and embedded in our culture, because uh, I will state that in my view and in the view of uh, anyone who's looking at history, our country was founded on racism and white supremacy. And unless we are all willing to really see this and accept it and deal with it as anyone other than BIPOC and BIPOC, it's not living in reality. So I'm naming quite directly that this is the foundation of how I work. Um, so NVC has some foundations in empathy and in what we call honest self-expression. Uh, and all of that done with discernment of is a person safe to be empathic? Is a person safe to uh, express themselves without threat of violence, uh, dismissiveness, exaggeration to minimize all the things that get used against people with less power? That was a lot of words, and it's important to me to get this set from the start. Um, and I would like to move into our first exercise. So I'm going to ask the group a question, and I'd like you to fill in the blank in this question. And here's the question. And maybe, Gail, if you want to write it in the chat, that might be helpful for people who do better visually as opposed to auditory information. The question is, um, I believe the world would be a better place if there was more blank. I believe the world would be a better place if there was more blank. So you can raise your hand and name it out loud. You can write it in the chat. I'm already seeing that someone has written love. Listening, if there is more listening. Yeah, Claudia, go ahead. Uh, compassion. Compassion. Thank you. I see patience. Someone else wrote compassion, trust. What else? Focus. Yeah. The world would be a better place if there was more generosity of spirit, understanding. You can go ahead and write more than one if something's coming up for you. What else? Part of this is a way for you to check in with yourself. What do you value? What are your values? Truth, equity, mm -hmm. patience and flexibility. Ah, more even spread of resources. Yeah, sort of more equity for resources, dignity. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Being, creating dignity creates more humanization. So easy to dehumanize people and dignity gives us an opportunity to remember our humanity. Yeah. Respect. Mm -hmm. Creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like this mix because there are many things that are important. Some are vital and imperative and some contribute to the pleasure of life. Fun and play, creativity, affection. Yeah, all right. So you can keep writing them in the chat if you like, and I'm going to go ahead and move forward with this exercise. Everything that you named here fits into the category through the lens of nonviolent communication as a universal human need. All humans need love. All humans. Uh, benefit from equity. Um, generosity of spirit contributes to the well-being of ourselves and other people. All of these uh, ways of showing up are in the lens of NVC universal human needs. Regardless of where you live, how you identify yourself, uh, your socioeconomic status, the argument is that everyone, every sentient human on our planet needs love. We need to belong. We need to matter. We need to contribute. Uh, we need collaboration. These are all universal human needs. And if you have your handout nearby, you can look at the universal uh, human needs wheel. Um, and I believe it is on page three. So if you, have, if you have your handout handy, that's great. If not, see if you can maybe bring it up so, because we are going to be using um, these uh, handouts throughout our, our, re, uh, our time together. So I also wanna say that although these are all considered universal human needs, of which there are many. As adults, with a lot of choice and autonomy, there are some needs that you may not be thinking about because you accept that you're going to receive these. Um, I worked for almost 20 years in the Washtenaw County Juvenile Jail, and I used to do this exercise with my students there. And if you can imagine for a moment what it might be like for a student who's locked up in juvenile jail, where there are cameras everywhere, where their day is highly regimented, where 99% um, of the things that happen are decided for them. Can you imagine how they might answer the question? Things would be better for me if there was more blank. Can you take a moment and imagine what it might be like? And again, raise your hand or write in the chat what you think some of their needs might be that are so normal and available to you that you don't, that you don't even think about it. And just go ahead and, yeah. So Elaine, thank you. Safety, right? Yeah, places like when, when students are remanded, it can be scary. Um, privacy. Thank you, Jillian. That is the one that always came up because there's no privacy in these settings. Quiet. Again, Diane, thank you. It's never quiet in these facilities. Even in the middle of the night, the doors clang, lights go on and off. Someone to help me. Yes. Touch. You know, I was a massage therapist for years before I became a social worker. And we all know the research that without touch, we don't thrive. It's imperative to thriving. Consideration, yeah. Um, and let me, let me come back to Gail, someone to help me. When you think about what needs are met by receiving help from someone, what do you imagine that might feel like? What do you imagine what the need might be around that? And I see, again, being seen. I might say something like uh, a need for support, a need for collaboration, um, 
a need to be, to have and receive care, you know, to matter and belong. Yeah. So what I'm doing around this exercise is there are some needs that you may have a pretty comfortable relationship with meeting, like privacy and consideration, touch, resources. And yet someone who's remanded in juvenile jail, I would say those needs, they might have a very vulnerable relationship with those needs. So it's not that privacy and consideration and quiet are important to us as adults. We just take it for granted we have control over environment in a way that others don't. So um, again, everyone has these needs. For some people, the needs are more up or more important or more in their awareness than other people. Yet we all can resonate with these needs. Um, so let me just check in. Clarifying questions. Do you have any clarifying questions about this idea of universal needs? Make sense? Okay, this, I'm naming this because this is a foundation of NVC. Now, of course, the issue is the way we go about trying to meet our needs, the strategies we use, the plans, the behavior and the activities are where the conflict happens. Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of NVC, used to say, conflict does not happen at the level of needs. Conflict happens at the level of strategies, how people go about attempting to meet the needs that are imperative for them. I will also name that we can all think of examples of people and cultures, uh, especially people in power or cultures where there's power over, that egregious, terrible things are done. And um, trying to work with, with needs around these situations takes unbelievable demand. And we're not really talking about that today. What we're talking about today is how to work with people in our everyday life settings to focus on needs focus on where we align around needs to get to more understanding and get to more connection, reduce conflict and build more affiliation. Yeah. How do we do it? Through the lens of NVC, we do it through empathy. And again, I'll say there are certain people, cultures, um, uh, uh, situations, political parties, where it, it's nearly impossible to have empathy. And that's okay. In situations where there is violence and where there is uh, inequity, empathy isn't necessarily the strategy I would choose because it can be used against you. It can create more problems for you. So I like to say empathy with discernment, empathy with an awareness of is the situation safe enough for me to offer empathy? Because the truth is, empathy is a vulnerable position to be in. So again, I wanna to turn to the group and say, what is empathy? How do you describe it? If you were talking to someone who was new to the world or didn't speak English and you wanted to describe empathy, what might you say? And just go ahead and raise your hand and, and I'll call on you. Or if you're uncomfortable with that and prefer to do the chat, write it in the chat. What does empathy mean to you? It's not a test. There's no wrong answers. Some discussions say that empathy is not enough, that the real goal should be beyond action. Yeah, uh, Diane's writing about whether empathy is actually the, the goal, the end to result. And I agree, empathy is one strategy among many strategies. Um, some people talk about empathy and compassion in this way, that empathy is the feeling and compassion is the action. Um, again, let me ask, 
how do you describe empathy? If you were going to explain it to someone, ah, Gail's writing, listening with my heart. Beautiful. What else? What are other ways? Empathy is making, and if you're, if you're not muted, would you go ahead and mute, please? I think a few people came on. Welcome. Good to see you. And will you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Empathy is making an effort to understand someone else's perspective and trusting their words. Beautiful. Yeah. Does it mean we have to agree with someone to offer them empathy? No, it sure doesn't. Sometimes we get this idea that in order to be empathic, it means I'm agreeing with someone. That if I don't argue with them or push back or name what's important to me, I'm somehow giving the impression that I'm aligned with them. And sometimes that's true. And there's time to have a voice and there's time to take a stand. Yet, empathy does not mean agreement. Empathy means I'm willing to stretch into imagining with warm curiosity what it's like to be then. I see Kathy wrote, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Yeah, that's kind of the classic, the classic description. Uh, Craig, go ahead and unmute. I see your hand. Yeah, uh, my thought of empathy is finding some level of existence that I have in common with somebody else. You know, obviously it might not be on the surface, something every day, but some, at some level we have something in common, even if it's just the fact that we're human beings on planet Earth. Yeah, look, this leads us into what it means to see someone for their humanity at the level of needs. How am I the same of this, as this person who has a completely different political stance, who's showing up in a hostile and aggressive way, who's demeaning me or people I care about? That is a massive stretch. And it's often where we are called to be as mediators, as people who are put in a position to try and find common threads and common ground with people who appear to be completely on opposite ends of an argument, a dispute, a conflict. So what I like to say about nonviolent communication is it's very simple in theory. Is it easy? Often not. Often it's a massive, massive stretch. Yet, when we can imagine with warm curiosity what it's like to be someone else, what their needs are, it can help humanize them. We don't have to agree with their strategy. We don't have to agree with hostile or violent words. However, if we're able to imagine what it's like to be them and touch into what's important to them, that is the, the chance of finding common ground. So clarifying questions or comments or pushback about what I've said so far. Just raise your hand and, or write it in the chat. It's possible you agree and that this makes sense to you and you're fine with it. And I also wanna make sure that there's room for people to say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? These people don't deserve our empathy. These people, you know, because we can all think of a hundred examples of times when imagining what it's like to be someone else is a bigger stretch than we have capacity for. And I want to honor that. I will be the first to say there are some people that their very best effort does not meet my minimal needs for equity, care, uh, and all the other values that I hold dear to myself. Empathy is a choice we make. If it does you harm, if it's overwhelming, if you're completely depleted, then you have choice about whether and how to engage. Yeah? All right. I want to move along. Ah. Uh, what about plain old, Greta's making a comment. What about plain old curiosity? Must I also summon warmth? I love that so much. Warm curiosity is the goal. Um, am I always able to do that? No, I'm not. However, I will say that 
curiosity about someone else with a reduction of judgment, evaluation, blame, and wrongness, and a desire to punish them, that's a great start. And we'll get into a bit more about what it's like to communicate when we're infuriated, anxious, worried, unsafe, and how to shift to have a better chance that someone will hear what's important to me. We'll get into that. A lot of this course will be scaffolding and building to the point where we're talking about how to prepare for really difficult conversations and how to have them. Yeah. Um, so if where you're at is just some curiosity, great, great place to start. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to do, I want to do an exercise with the group um, that I think is a helpful way to put into practice utilizing empathy and upping our awareness of our responses to situations that we, we offer to be helpful but aren't always helpful and definitely aren't empathy. Because the more clarity you have about what's empathy and what isn't, the better chance you have of choosing how you want to respond to everyone. So what I'd like to do, this is going to be interactive and it's going to mean people are going to be uh, helpful about this. So I'm going to ask for a volunteer. And what I'd like is someone who can volunteer in about 30 seconds uh, an event that happened to them that they found annoying, aggravating, irritating, um, problematic. And on the reactivity scale of zero being this meant nothing to me and the reactivity scale of 10 being I lost my damn mind, I'm looking for like a three. I want it to be real, but because this is an exercise, I don't want it to lead to a lot of dysregulation or um, a huge uh, um, uh, reactive uh, emotionality because it is an exercise. So something that you can share that happened in about 30 seconds that annoyed you. And what will happen is I'll ask you to share the story in whatever language you want. We'll work with you around some non-empathic responses. And then afterwards, we're going to give you a lot of empathy for it, just as a way to start practicing this. So who's going to be, in my view, brave, courageous, willing to step up and offer a scenario. It can be something as simple as someone cutting you off in traffic, which for some of us is a three and some of us is a 10, I, I agree. Or uh, someone does something that's annoying or difficult or that got you lit up a little bit. Who is willing? Okay, I see Elaine. Thank you so much. I appreciate you volunteering. Have you got a little story? I do, a very little okay. one. <laughs> Please don't worry about using any kind of special language. Just tell it in all your full aggravation or annoyance, please. All right, all right. I just wanted to order a pizza. <laughs> and so, I, but I wanted to get the best deal that I could. So I first went online and uh, logged in on my account in this pizza vendor and discovered that there was, it looked like there was no way to access uh, a good deal. So I, I tried to call my local pizza place. First, I had trouble finding the number. By the time I found the number, I called, um, person answered, and it was just one of those maddeningly slow processes. And I kept thinking, this is very simple. This is like down the street from me. All you need is my name and what I want. And it took more than five minutes. And the representative asked me my name probably five times, um, you know, asked me for my order, got back to me two or three times, different times saying, what was that again? And are you sure that's what you wanted? And I was just, I was trying to be patient, um, but I was really irritated. And finally, yeah. you know, at the end, she said, thank you so much. We're so glad that you ordered pizza with us. And I was just, you know, 
ready to hang up on her. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Elaine. That story will work fine. Okay. Everyone else on the call, I would like you to go to your handouts and go to page six. Elaine, I don't want you to do that because you're the volunteer. So you just stay here. And what's going to happen next is people are going to say responses to your story to you. You may think they're funny. You may feel put out by them. You may have all kinds of different responses. I'm going to ask that you don't, uh, don't respond. Um, and for someone who's asking about the handout, there is a link to it farther up in the chat. Ah, I see that Jillian just shared the document. Thank you so much, Jillian, for doing that. Okay, so the, the way this is going to work is I'm just going to call on people to read these what we call empathy blockers. And the example in the handout may not perfectly fit Elaine's scenario, but I'd like you to shift it around as much as you can so it does. And Elaine, I'm going to start to model it, and then I'm going to call on people in order on my screen. If you don't want to do it, just pass. Just say pass, and I'll go on to the next person. For all you frustrated actors out there, this is a time to really play it up. Have some fun with it. Okay, so here's the first one. I'm not going to read which empathy blocker it is. I'm just going to give the example. Oh, Elaine, don't worry about it. I'm sure it wasn't the end of the world. I mean, it'll, it's, I'm sure it's just fine. Okay, that's the first one. Craig, could I ask you to unmute and read the second one, please? Oh, um, and, and while I'm waiting, I, I'm reading something that Jillian shared that has to do with that. Uh, when I'm imagining what someone experiences, I'm wrong. It's really hard to understand someone's perspective if you don't actively talk to them and listen. I agree. It's easy to make assumptions when we have a storyline. And we're going to talk about that later, too, how to shift from our storylines and our assumptions into what we might call clean observations. And it looks, Jillian, like you, you sent it along. And Thank voila, there we Thank go. Thank you, Jillian. Thanks so much, Jillian. So let's go. I could see where this could be confusing to folks if you didn't have the handout available. Um, so let's get back to it. And Craig, can I come back to you? And I'm going to go ahead and read the first one again. And then Craig, if you'll go to the second one. And again, you don't need to read what particular kind of empathy blocker it is. Just give the example. So again, um, uh, Elaine, I'll get started. Oh, Elaine, don't worry about it. I think you're making too big a deal about this. It's really not that big a deal. I mean, it's not the end of the world after all. Uh, okay, Craig, how about you go next, please? Okay. I get just what you mean. Your neighbor really is so inconsiderate. He's clueless. Yeah, and in this case, it might be the pizza person. Um, but it's the same idea. It's, this is a form of what we call commiserating. Um, okay, let's see who's next. Gail, would you unmute and do number three? Listen, Elaine. Everything happens for a reason. Did you really even need that pizza and really want it anyway? <laughs> Thank you, Gail. All right, let's see. Uh, Susan, would you unmute? Are you willing to do the next one, which is number four? Uh, yeah, just a sec. I got to bring it up here. Uh, mm -hmm. Number four. Um, oh, don't worry. Here, let me tell you something funny I heard the other day. It'll cheer you up. Great. Thank you. Claudia, would you unmute and do number five, please? Okay, I just had, here we go. Uh-huh, take why your time. Thanks. Uh, why don't you stop that approach and try it this way? Or just ignore the situation if you can't talk to that person directly. Right. So again, this is uh, offering advice. Um, let's see. Let me see who's next. Uh, Andy, would you be willing to read number six, please? Sure. Feeling sorry for someone or sharing how you feel about their situation. Oh, you poor thing. I feel so bad for you. 
I feel so sorry for what you're going through. Beautiful. Thank you. And how about Diane? Would you unmute and be willing to do um, number seven? Yeah, number seven just disappeared. Hang on. Oh, yep, it's okay. Yep. Seems like my computer won't do two things at once there. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Really, Elaine, don't be silly. Don't be ridiculous. I mean, it's not logical to keep going with a pizza person like that. It's not a great way to handle it at all. I mean, that's... <laughs> Great. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Karen, would you unmute and be willing to do um, uh, number eight, please? Oh, can you, are you having trouble unmuting? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and skip you and go on to Greta. Thank you, Karen. Greta, would you unmute and do um, the uh, number eight, please? You're always so sensitive. Goodness gracious. You overreact to everything. Maybe that's because your mother was kind of that way. Okay. Great. Thank you, Greta. Uh, let's see. We've got um, uh, Phyllis. Can you unmute, please, and read number uh, nine? Now, now you know how I felt when the same thing happened to me last year. Thank you. Beautiful. And let's see, Jillian, would you be willing to unmute and uh, do number 10 for us? Oh my gosh. One time I had it so much worse than you. I was having a party and the pizzas didn't show up. At least that didn't happen to you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking a turn to do this. Elaine, let me check in with you if you'll unmute, please, and let me know what was it like for you to receive these, what we call empathy blockers? Well, I, I was not validated in any way. <laughs> uh, no one heard me. No one was yes. responding to what was going on for me. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that doesn't feel so great. We want to be seen and heard and understood. Yeah. Thank you. Can I hear from a few of you who offered some of these? If you had your own response to offering something that you might not typically say or that you heard something and thought, ooh, I do that all the time. Either one. I'd like to hear from a few of you. Go ahead and raise your physical or mechanical hand. Uh, yeah, Greta, go ahead. I'm the positive spin. I would have possibly pointed out that the guy answering the phone is probably juggling a lot of different things and yeah yeah thanks look how many of you naturally sort of fall into oh gosh you know can you imagine what it's like to be him he was probably underpaid and uh, overwhelmed blah 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 raise your hand if you do this right <laughs> right Look, there is nothing inherently wrong with any of these responses, but they're not empathy. And if you want to build connection with someone, if you want to encourage someone to feel heard and received and understood, these will generally not do it. Yeah. Any, tell me your clarifying questions or comments around this that you might be wondering about some of them. Yeah, Phyllis, go ahead and unmute, please. Oh, you're there, you're there, yeah. Um, so I realize that it, it's always very tempting to say, I know how you feel. Either I've had that experience or, um, and, but we don't know. Um, well, right, and I mean, sometimes we might know and we'll get lucky and guess. Um, and if that guess is mixed up with some of these empathy blockers, it may not land as well as you might want it to. Yeah? Yeah. Gail, I saw your hand up. Do you want to make a comment? Oh, I was just saying, I can't wait till you get to the part where we hear what we're supposed to say. <laughs> uh, right. We're going to do that next. Okay, good. And often what Gail just shared is something that many people feel. 
it creates a bit of anxiety or a little bit of distress that somehow we've contributed to Elaine not being heard and received. And anyone who does the work that you all do probably have a little bit more built-in natural empathy. Because it's really hard to do this kind of helping work if you don't. So let me just check any other questions or comments about what's empathy and what isn't. Yeah, Claudia. How about uh, if you say, don't sweat the small stuff? I seem to say that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> be considered small stuff. Yeah. And look, these comments, let's come back to universal human needs for a minute. All of these comments, even though they're empathy blockers, do meet some need. And my guess is, Claudia, when you say to someone, don't sweat the small stuff, you have a need to support them feeling positive and empowered and reminding them that there's so much to be grateful about. Yeah, that's the need that drives it. That need is beautiful. And here's a pro tip. If before you offer a helpful sort of statement, you can give a bit of empathy first. Before you make that other comment, it will likely land better. So this is a natural lead into the next part. So Claudia, thank you for that. <laughs> what I'd like to do now is I'd like everyone except for Elaine to go back to your handout and scroll back up to the top to page um, four, which has a list of feelings. And I would like you to look on the right-hand side where it says when needs are not being fulfilled. Above that handout is the needs wheel, where you're looking at potential needs of Elaine's that were not met. I'd like you, all of you who are going to volunteer, and I hope many of you will, because it will be much more powerful and it will also support Elaine, and that is to do the next step that we call an empathy guess. It's empathy because we're going to feel into what Elaine might be feeling, what her experience is from the feeling level, and what her unmet need is related to this conversation she had. And then we're going to make a warm inquiry. We're not going to tell her what she's feeling or needing. We're not going to uh, interrogate her. We're simply going to make a warm guess. And it will sound like this. I'm going to demonstrate it, and I'm going to use very formal, nonviolent communication workshop language. This is not natural language, and we'll talk a little bit more about using natural language. But in a workshop, it's helpful to have a very formal, protocol so that you don't have to think about the protocol and instead you can touch in to the actual feelings and needs. Okay, so as you're looking at your handouts, think of a couple of feelings you might imagine Elaine is feeling or what she actually said and what needs she might be that are calling for her attention. Here's a helpful hint. Sometimes whatever the feeling is, it's the opposite that is the need. For example, here's a really simple one. If someone states they're feeling uncomfortable, their need might be for comfort. If someone's feeling a bit misunderstood, they might be wanting understanding. Um, so that's, that's a helpful way to frame this if you need a bit more support. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with Elaine. And again, Elaine, I'm going to ask you not to respond. Just simply receive what people are saying. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start. Elaine, when I hear your story, gosh, I just wonder if you're just, you know, feeling so frustrated and really wanting more ease. So notice, I'm not making up a story about it. I'm not justifying or explaining why I'm making this guess. I'm simply saying, are you feeling frustrated and you'd like some ease? or you, you know, your need is for ease, okay? Any clarifying questions about the instructions? Okay, I would love it 
to hear from a few of you. And remember, there is no such thing as a wrong empathy guess. If it doesn't land with Elaine, that's okay. You're still giving her the gift, the precious gift of your attention and intention to support her. And that's what empathy is. So who wants to go next? Who's willing? Who's willing to go next? Go ahead and raise your hand and give it a try. Yeah, Craig, great, unmute. Okay, uh, Elaine, just wondering if you're feeling aggravated at the, the lack of competence that you're dealing with and you would really appreciate more competence when you're dealing with professional, you know, people giving you service. Beautiful, beautiful. You named a feeling? Did you say aggravation? Yeah, yes. aggravation. And then there were a lot of words and then you said competence, yeah? And I can see Elaine doesn't have to say anything. She gave you a thumbs up and I can see she's receiving that. So Craig, I'm, is it okay if I, I'm so loving the guess and can I shorten it for you? Sure. Are you feeling aggravated? Because competence is so important to you. No storyline, no explaining, simple, short, sweet. Yeah? Less words is better. Yeah? Beautiful. Thank you, Craig, for both the guests and letting me use your example as a teachable moment. I appreciate it. Who's next? Yeah, Susan, unmute, please. Elaine. You must have been really irritated, and I'll bet you it's because, partly because, you were just really hungry. You wanted that pizza. <laughs> yes, beautiful. And if she's hungry, what need wants to be met? Well, I think hunger is a pretty basic need. <laughs> hunger is a feeling. It's an experience. It's a sensation. If you're hungry, what need do you want met? We could say sustenance, a full belly. Yeah, beautiful. Again, Susan, I love that you got that visceral, you're hungry. You want to be fed. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Um, who else? Let's have another example. Yeah, Margaret, thanks for volunteering. Go ahead and unmute. It's so hard to be patient, Elaine, in these situations. I know when people are learning or people are just taking too long. Okay. I really love how you're starting out here. You're sort of, you're, you're joining her in what you imagine is going on for her, which is you're, you're saying it's hard to be patient. So what are you guessing she's feeling? What's the opposite of patience? Impatience. Yeah. So let's frame it this way. Gosh, Elaine, I wonder if part of what you're feeling is really impatient. Yeah? And if someone's feeling impatient, what is the unmet need? This could be a little tricky, but let's all help. Let's all help with this. If, if the feeling is impatience, what need do you want met? Any ideas? Look at your needs wheel. Take a moment. Look at your needs wheel. Touch into what it feels like when you're impatient. What do you want more of? Uh, yeah, Kathy, go ahead. It's like somebody's not really listening to you. They're not paying okay. to you. Yeah, so if I'm feeling unheard or I'm feeling like someone's not receiving me, I might want to be received. Yeah. In this case, let's specifically, oh, I see someone just wrote in the chat competency. Sure. If I'm feeling really impatient, I might want someone to be effective. I want effectiveness, efficiency, competence. I also might want some ease. I want some relaxation. Yeah. I want satisfaction. Right. This makes sense. You know, it's, it's not always easy to slow down and take the time, let me just see, to um, imagine 
this from not a judgmental place, but a place of relating to someone's feelings and needs. And I, I see Gail writing, hey, if I feel impatience, I'm thinking time. Yeah, and when we're feeling time pressed, we often want effectiveness, ah, respect, all of these sorts of things, yeah? So let's try for one more. Anyone else want to give it a try? What else might Elaine be feeling? And what is the unmet need? Anything else maybe that hasn't been named yet? I love the ones that are named so far. Yeah, okay. All right. I mean, this is a great. I oh. can't. I tried. I try not to barge in because I always barge in. So I'm trying oh. to lay back. So I, I, I appreciate that. So you invited me to barge. So yes. um, I would say, um, Elaine, uh, I hear you feeling helpless and in this situation. Um, and you really would like to have some ideas of what to do next because you need help. Mm, okay. Thank you. And, you know, um, let me listen for the feeling. Yeah, that it might, there might be a sense of sort of helplessness. That, that's possible. And if you feel helpless, what do you want more of? Understanding, you know. Understanding. Efficiency, those other things we've already talked support, about. Support, effectiveness, right. Empowering. Yeah, and let me say, Diane, I appreciate you to me, this is you holding the group with care. Um, let's see, where was I? Yeah, Diane, thank you for holding the group with care around wanting to make sure people who don't normally speak have a chance to speak. That's lovely. And I also want to hear from anyone who has something to say. So I don't consider barging in to offer your take on things. And I like that you're taking a moment to give other people time. Thank you for that. So, Elaine, let me check in with you. How was it this time to receive these, what I would call, warm uh, bids to connect with you through a feelings and needs guess? It was great. Um, and many of them landed really well. And I'll say, I, I'm looking at the needs wheel, mm -hmm. and I, there are a couple of things that I was aware that were operating for me during the little story that aren't yeah. on the wheel. And I oh. would really appreciate your perspective on these things and maybe others too. I Great. would have said when, when Diane said you're feeling helpless because you'd like more control mm. of the mm -hmm. situation. So I was looking for yeah. something that referenced control. There's empowerment. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to be more empowered. So that's true. The other yeah. thing that I was looking for that I was really feeling the lack of in the, mm -hmm. in the scenario was um, productivity. Or I want to get something done. I want effectiveness. To something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is yeah. that somewhere here on the wheel? I don't see it. it. I love this question, Elaine. And first, let me speak to <laughs> you naming that it is that even though this was just an activity, People's guesses landed with you. You felt their care and their attention and intention. And that's really beautiful. That's the goal behind connecting through empathic um, words and nonverbals. Um, and I'll remind you that the, the more simple it can be and the more of an actual guess, I wonder if you're feeling this. Gosh, I'm curious about this. Are you feeling this? And because you're wanting more of this, that simple statement without explanations, without storylines, with all out of that, is the ultimate in making a clear, clean empathy guess. Let me answer your question, Elaine. There are plenty of needs that aren't on the wheel. Control is an interesting one. It comes up a lot in NVC circles. Is control a need or a strategy to meet another need? If you're not sure, I would say ask yourself, when you think about the word control, what needs of yours are met? Now, 
most of us, when we think about control, what we really want is choice and agency. We want power over our own selves. We want um, uh, trust. So even though some people say, well, control is a need, I'm more interested in what other needs are met if someone has control. Yeah? When we can tell the difference between a need and a strategy, we're much better able to use NVC in very practical ways. So actually this leads into our next exercise. So again, I'm grateful that you're bringing up this question. Um, and let me, before we move on to the next activity, let me just take a moment and hear from people who offered the empathy guesses. Anything you want to share about what this was like for you? Did it feel better? Was it awkward? How hard was it? Was it easy? Did it make sense? I'd like to hear from a few of you. Anybody have anything to share about this? And if you prefer writing in the chat instead of speaking out in the group, that's fine too. You always have that option. Let me let me ask a yeah, go ahead, Gail. I, I was mm -hmm. just thinking when I was thinking about how I would respond, I could not get kind of beyond her need for pizza. Yes. <laughs> right. And of course, a need for pizza. That's actually a strategy. Pizza is a strategy to meet a need. What's the need? Go ahead, Gail, name what some of the needs might be met by having a pizza. Substance, that, that Sus one? Sustenance, sure. Maybe pleasure. Um, uh, satisfaction. Um, comfort, yeah. All of these are possible. We don't know, but we can make a guess. So this is great because again we're going to move into um, uh, we're going to move into what is a need and what is a strategy to meet a need because until we're clear about what's an actual universal human need and what's a strategy to meet a need it can be really confusing and um, you know Marshall used to say make this statement and it's so powerful to me he would say. Every act of violence, and by violence he meant hostility, uh, negativity, um, uh, um, anything, not just physical violence, but violence of thought and deed and action. He would say every act of violence is a tragic example of an unmet need. Every act of violence is a tragic example of an unmet need. What he was really saying is the strategies people use to meet their needs often have terrible consequences, as we know. So the more clear we are about what our needs are and the strategies we use to meet those needs, the easier it is to connect with other people around their needs, even if we can't relate to or understand their strategies. So this leads me to the next exercise. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go to your handout and go to page 11. And page 11 um, is how to make effective requests. It's also the same format and protocol we use to distinguish between what is a strategy and what is a need? So um, you don't have to take notes about this because it is in your handout. And I want to talk about it first in terms of strategies. There are some differences that make it easy to tell if something's a need or strategy. For one thing, needs are permanent. They have a life of their own, whether they're met or unmet. Strategies are temporary. They come and go. They are based on all kinds of factors. If you're thinking about something and you're trying to figure out, is it a need or a strategy, ask yourself if it has any of the following things 
It's a strategy to meet a need. If there is a specific person involved, if it has a specific location, if there's a specific action around it, if it fits into a time frame, um, or there's an object involved, like dirty dishes in the sink, gas in the car, the report on someone's desk. Those are not needs, those are strategies to meet needs. So we use this acronym PLATO, person, location, action, time, and object, to distinguish is what I want actually a need or a strategy to meet a need. And it's also the same format we use in NVC to make an effective request. How many of you have made requests that you think are really clear? Hey, I want you to listen to me. Or you never give me affection. I want affection. These are strong desires or preferences. Yet the ask is so vague that the person you're asking may have a very different idea of what it means to offer affection. If I say to someone, hey, it's your turn to clean up the kitchen, they may unload the dishwasher and think, well, that's cleaning up the kitchen. Whereas I might have in mind, sweep the floor, wipe down the counters, wash the pots and pans, and 10 other things. If you consider, who is this request for? Where's the request happening? What is the action specifically that you want to have accomplished? What's the time frame? Is it every Tuesday at four o'clock or is it after every meal or is it before I get home from work? And what's the object? Well, the dirty dishes in the sink in this example, okay? So I'm offering this framework for two reasons. Consider all these specifics when you're making a request and as we work with needs and we work with strategies, use this to figure out, is the control I want a strategy to meet other needs or is it at the actual need, okay? What are your clarifying questions? What are your comments about this section around strategies and needs and effective requests? Raise your physical hand or your mechanical hand. Yeah, Kathy, go ahead. So could you be a little bit more specific about deciding whether something is a need or a strategy by using the Play-Doh? I don't quite sure. understand how that would work. Thanks. Sure, okay. <clears throat> Let's say this. Um, okay, I, I have a need for ice cream. I really need some ice cream. Let me ask the group, is that a need or is a strategy to meet a, meet a need? What do you think? Kathy, you're muted. Go ahead and unmute. It's a strategy. How did you figure it was a strategy? Because you wanted <clears throat> something to eat. I mean, you were hungry or you had some sort of physical sensation you need you said that mm -hmm. you're trying to satisfy. If I said, I'm really hungry and I have a need for sustenance, I'm not saying how I'm going to get that sustenance. I'm not saying who's getting it for me, where I'm having it, what I'm going to do to get it, right? When I say I have a need for ice cream, ice cream is the object. So that fits into person, location, action, time, and object. That means it's not a need. Does that make more sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. Clarifying questions, other comments? <clears throat> yeah, Phyllis, unmute. Um, I'm wondering if we might get confused between a need and a want. Sure. You know, there are lots of ways to talk about needs. Sometimes we talk about values, we talk about what's important to us, we talk about um, you know, some needs are essential for survival. Yeah, food, housing, clothing, clean water, uh, food security, all those sorts of things. And then we have our preferences and our desires and our wants. Um, often in a workplace setting, instead of using the word needs, 
we substitute that with values or something being important. Um, if you have a preference for something, if there's something you want, you can do the same Plato test. This want that I have, does it involve another person, an, a location, an action, a time, or an object? If it does, it's a strategy. And there's nothing wrong with strategies. It's how we get things done. It's how we live in the world. My wants are often met by the strategies I utilize. Yeah? Nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> Needs, on the other hand, aren't about preferences or thoughts or beliefs. They are about um, uh, a universal shared idea that every human has. Every human has a need for sustenance, yeah? But not every human's going to want a cheeseburger with french fries for that sustenance when you consider that huge parts of the world population are vegetarians or don't have access to the level of food that most of us in this country have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Using the Plato test can be really helpful when you're looking for clarity about what's a need, what's a want, what's a strategy to meet a need. And you might wonder, well, why is this distinction so important between needs and strategies? It's because it can be really confusing to say, well, I need you to do this and that. That's mixing up needs and strategies, and it's really confusing to people. And when it happens, people think, well, NBC doesn't work. I said what my need was. Well, what you're saying isn't really a need. It's a strategy to meet a need. Yeah? Again, clarifying questions. Comments, what do you have? Okay, since I'm not hearing questions, I'm going to move forward with the idea that this is making sense and you're following along. This is a lot of information to all take in at once if this is new to you. So I certainly want to encourage everyone to just take it in, look at the handouts, and consider different ways to start utilizing attending to your own feelings at any given time and what needs might be associated with that and perhaps having curiosity about someone else's uh, actions that might confuse you or leave you feeling baffled or annoyed or irritated and begin to say to listen to the pain talk underneath their words what are they feeling and what need is calling for their attention that they might not even be aware of, okay? We have time for one more activity before we close for today's session. Can I see a show of hands about energy level? Are people feeling like you can tolerate another 10 minutes with one more activity before we close? Can you raise your hand if you're feeling like you can tolerate that? Great. If you haven't raised your hand and you need a bio break or you need to get up and stretch and move around, please feel free but my plan is to end on time. Okay, one last activity before we close, and I'd like you again to go to your handout, and let me just see, we're gonna go to page eight. And page eight is a handout about gratitude. Now, most of us know that gratitude's gotten a lot of attention lately in all kinds of circles because the benefits of gratitude are measurably helpful to our well-being. Sharing, having a gratitude practice, attending to gratitude lowers re resentment. It helps us get in touch with what we have. It actually, when we consider what things we're grateful for, it boosts our dopamine and the dopamine centers in our brain light up and we feel good. When we share gratitude that we have for someone else, guess what? Their dopamine lights up too. Even more remarkable is that if I share gratitude to someone else and there are witnesses, their dopamine lights up. Here's the thing that really blows my mind about gratitude. I have a daily gratitude practice. Sometimes I'm really out of sorts or I'm in a bad mood or I'm feeling resentful and I'm having trouble connecting with my gratitude. 
Simply me saying to myself, okay, I want to center myself and connect with my gratitude. Even if I can't think of anything in the moment, the intention to look for gratitude, boom, lights up the dopamine. It's a win-win. The other thing that is beautiful about gratitude through the lens of NVC is that the protocol we use for sharing gratitude, either for ourselves or someone else, is the exact same protocol we use when we want to approach someone else for a connecting conversation. Now, connecting conversation is another way to say difficult conversations. Only usually when I talk about difficult conversations, people get really anxious because most people, a lot of people, like to avoid conflict. And difficult conversations are associated with conflict. So now I like to say connecting conversations, the conversations previously known as difficult conversations, means the same thing. It's approaching something that we might have some distress, anxiety, worry, or actual fear about. So our next session will be about how to prepare for connecting or difficult conversations and how to have them in the most effective and enlivening way. And the best way to practice it ahead of time is by practicing gratitude for two reasons. One is gratitude is something most people are usually really willing to receive. If it's authentic and it's specific, and it's not a judgment about someone that's praise, it typically lands really well. Gratitude, when it's offered in this way, is a vulnerable gift. So if you, when you look at the handout, you can see that the, first, the very first thing about it is something very specific that someone else said or did, a clear observation. I'm remembering you said this, or I'm remembering you did this. That's the observation. Observations are not judgments, positive or negative. They're not evaluations, positive or negative. They're not filled with storylines about what it means. They're what a camera might capture, a fact that everyone can agree on. We'll talk about observations more in our next session, only for this uh, gratitude, this is what I want to focus on. So I'd like you to take a couple of minutes. I'd like you to think of someone for whom you have a bit of gratitude. It can be something really small. And I want you to, to either fill out your gratitude gram or write it on a separate piece of paper or just think it out um, and make the clear observation. Name the feeling you have about it. That could sound like, I feel gratitude, and maybe there's other feelings, relief, um, uh, support, um, or let's not use support as a feeling. I feel relief, I feel delighted, I'm excited, um, I'm pleasantly surprised, whatever other feelings come with it. I, I'm, I, have, I feel gratitude and. Then figure out what need is met. Maybe it's a need for support encouragement, uh, to be seen, to be seen for your intentions, um, to have shared reality. Use your feelings and needs wheel. You can ignore the request part of that for now. We're just looking at clean observation, the feeling, and the need. Any questions from anyone about how this exercise is meant to be done? Raise your hand or just speak out or put it in the chat. Okay, let's take about three minutes. And if you don't complete it, that's okay. Think of a simple gratitude. Write it out as, you know, friend, family member, whatever. When you said this or you did this specific thing, I felt grateful and, and the need for this and this was met. And I'll tell you when the three minutes is up. Could I see a show of hands for anyone who's finished? If you've completed this, could I see a show of hands? Okay, great.
Okay, in the interest of time, if you haven't finished, that's okay. You can work on this whenever you want. And in fact, I encourage you to let gratitude be part of your daily living because it supports you and it supports other people. Not as a bypass to ignore real pain or real difficulty or to ignore what's calling for your attention. Simply to support your sense of well-being and connection. So in the little bit of time we have left, I'd love to hear from someone. Is there anyone who would be willing to read your gratitude gram, your gratitude handout to the group to share how this worked for you? Anybody willing? Go ahead and raise your hand or your mechanical hand if it's something you would be willing to do. Uh, Phyllis, yeah, go ahead, unmute. So um, I have a bunch of photographs from an event that I wanted to put into a photo book. I've done photo books in the past with help and of course I've already forgotten the process. So my friend came over and she was going to help and it got it got complicated and anyway she took everything home to work on her computer and um, and she offered to actually uh, make up the book for me. So, so do you I, have a gratitude gram for your friend? So I am very grateful to her. Okay. For doing that. Okay. Um, do you want to read I, what you wrote? Well, I'm not sure I did the exercise quite as you anticipated, but so I felt mm -hmm. relief yeah. and support. Yeah. And it met my need of getting the task done and also avoiding the stress around <laughs> the task. Okay. I don't know Beautiful. what you Beautiful. had in mind. Beautiful. It is. And, and here's the thing, Phyllis. Well, first, let me just see when everyone else in the group heard this. Did you feel a bit of like, oh, that's really sweet. Like it, it felt nice to you. Yeah. To hear this. Yeah. Here's what I want to say. It's less important to me that Phyllis uses the exact protocol of NVC. What's more important to me that Phyllis captured her feeling and she captured what she was able to avoid. Sometimes with NVC, the protocol can get in the way of the authentic feeling. Just to have it be a teachable moment, Phyllis, I'm going to translate it into NVC language just to make it clear what's the feeling and what's the need and what's the observation. Is that okay with you? Sure. Yeah. Here's the observation. When my friend took all my photographs home, and offered to put all my photographs and organize them for me. I felt such relief. And Phyllis, maybe you were delighted about it too. And you also felt a lessening of stress, which means maybe some relaxation and ease. And it really met your needs for support and this is a bit of a strategy, completion of a project that was hanging over you, which I would say met your needs for um, ease, for uh, pleasure, for enjoyment. Yeah? Yep. So thank you, Phyllis, for offering that. The takeaway is don't let the protocol get in the way of authentic feelings and authentic needs. The protocol is simply there to support you. Between this call and our next call, I encourage you, practice gratitude grams. Think about offering gratitude to coworkers, to family, to friends, using as much natural language as you can. First, the invitation. Hey, I've got some gratitude for you. Are you on for hearing it? Likely the person will say, sure. Then you say, you know, when you said this or you did this, I felt so grateful and relieved. 
or grateful and delighted or grateful and pleasantly surprised. Because you know what? That kind of support's really important to me. Yeah? Also, practice gratitude for yourself. During the next days, between now and our next meeting, throughout the day, check in with yourself and say, hmm, what am I feeling and what am I needing? And by feeling sensations, emotions, experiences, not the thoughts or the storylines, but what's actually happening for you and what needs are calling for your attention. And when we get back together next time, bring with you a story or an event or an activity or something that's holding some conflict for you that you want to be able to address in a really effective way so the person you want to share with can receive what you're saying. Because that's what we're going to work on next time. Okay? I want to close formally because we're at one o'clock. Elaine, are you still with us? I'm looking for Elaine. She may have already left. But I yep. want to say thanks to Elaine for volunteering. Thanks to Craig for offering a bit of technical support. And Gail, thank you so much for inviting me and holding the meeting. And thanks to everyone for being so engaged and part of this. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much, Lisa. This was fabulous. Great. Thank, thanks a thank lot, you everyone. All.